There is so much to talk about when it comes to manufacturing and development for hardware startups and how to do this right. This is generally a 45 minute talk that I struggle to get through in time because there's so much to say. Um, so we're just going to rock it. So real quick, uh, our company, my company, Berkeley Sourcing Group, we do development and manufacturing for startups. We've been doing this for 10 years. Uh, we've been, you know, kind of before it was cool, before there was crowdfunding, before there was a lot of stuff. And uh, so we've really learned a lot from the startups that have gone through this many times. Uh, I'm founder of Hardware Massive, uh, which you guys know about now. Hardware Con is a, an annual event that I'm founder of in Silicon Valley. We uh, you know, we have Panasonic, Autodesk, J. Bull, some big companies sponsor. We have CEO of Autodesk, uh, Local Motor CEO, Tim O'Reilly, Media Group speak at these events. It's basically like this, but 10 times bigger with uh, booths and breakout sessions and experts and Heads of Y Combinator, there, head of you know Indiegogo, Kickstarter, those kind of folks. So, uh, great, great place to go if you're looking to take it to the next level. That will happen in March uh, next year. We just finished. That's HardwareCon.com. Uh, you can check me out on LinkedIn and get all this info. <coughs> Actually, it's a bit out of date, but <laughs> I just get a few. So. Um, Real quick, this is what we do. These are uh, a few of our products. We kind of do everything: wearables. This is a micro infancy micro injection product that's a sports game, uh, watch, modifiable watches, world's first IoT game, and live act, world's first playable live action game. You should definitely check those guys out, they're coming out. Um, it's hard to get two world's first into one game, but they did it. Um, we've been working with him for nine years on um, prototyping. It was really, really, really hard. Um, <laughs> We, we really focus on DFM to qualify product, <clears throat> design for manufacturing, uh, for those that don't know what DFM is. And uh, you've worked with 800 plus startups and, and 200 plus Chinese factories over that time. <clears throat> so the story is, why is this stuff important? You've, there's a great book out there, Poorly Made in China, if you guys are into the manufacturing. <laughs> I've basically experienced all of these things firsthand in, in slightly different situations, but they're all true. It's pretty wild. Um, it's getting a whole lot better, I gotta say. But uh, one of my favorites is a guy wants to make a boot. He sends a boot to a Chinese factory. He says, I want 10,000 of these. It happens to have a nail in it. So he gets 10,000 boots with nails in them. <laughs> so, oops, quality control problem. <clears throat> Uh, my personal experience, uh, we, when I first came on as a quality manager for a previous company, we made a battery, it was a slow charge battery, the management said, hey, we want this to be a fast charge battery, they didn't really provide much details about how that was, so they went from eight hours to one hour, they didn't give a lot of information, batteries exploded on the charger, one of them exploded in a drill, very, very bad. So that's why all the stuff that I'm going to talk about is very important. You've got to get this stuff lined up correctly. You've got to follow the process through and you've got to do the quality control to make sure that you're not going to hurt anybody and that you're not going to uh, lose your business. So I'm going to talk kind of about two different areas, the, the general strategy and the execution. And one thing I want to start with is that what we're doing here right now is really the future. It really has hardly been done. It's been only successfully done by a very small number of people. In history, you've heard some great stories about this guy who invented this and became rich and famous. Reality is, in almost all of those cases, he had a rich uncle or he, had, <laughs> he was, happened to be the president of GE or something like that, and he had all these connections that he plugged into an existing ecosystem with existing experts and uh, all of the support that made all of that possible. You know, starting from scratch, raising all the money, coming up with the idea, doing the design, the engineering, the manufacturing, the distribution, all of that stuff is really, really brand new. And it's still being proven, and, and so there's not a lot of case studies to draw from, and there's there's still a lot of people that have tried and failed. Um, 
but it's it's still fairly hard. You know, you look a lot of the success stories that you even see on modern media. The coolest cooler, right? The large, the biggest crowdfunding uh, campaign on Kickstarter, thirteen million dollars, gone, right? And they're not. You, you hear about them as a success story. You don't hear about them as a failure, right? And that's what happens a lot of times. So. It is really hard, and, and I'm going to go through a lot of the reasons why that is and how to really try to prevent that. So, with startups, you have to have a fairly unique strategy, right? This stuff is not tried and true, so you have to understand the big picture. You have to go at it from, from a, a bit of a different way than ha has existed historically. First, you're going to have to find the right partners, right? There are a lot of areas of, of expertise. Um, in another talk that I give, it's a bit more general. You know, there's basically 20 areas of expertise that you're competing with in a big company. They're going to have a tooling guy who has 10 years experience, right? They're going to have a packaging designer who has 10 years of experience. They're going to have a marketing guy that has 10 years of experience. Yeah, girl, woman, you name it. Um, so you are not going to be able to really compete at that level unless you have people that understand how to compete at that level and pull them in in the right ways. Obviously, it starts with your core team, but if your core team is only two, three, four, or five people, you're still gonna need another 15 people, companies, you name it, that really support you throughout that process. So how do you find those people, all right? It's, there's all kinds of categories. What are the key things? First, they should be transparent, right? You need to learn a lot. You're not going to learn anything if your partners keep the information from you, right? You need to learn how to drive your business. So you're going to rely on them to do their job and do the marketing or the packaging design or whatever, but you're not going to be able to make those big business decisions unless you know you start to learn what those involve, right? So you want them to share that secret sauce and really work with you to help you grow as a startup and then get better. Responsiveness is a really great one to analyze because no matter what they're doing, engineering, design, so forth, you can measure quantitatively how quickly they reply to your email, right? Is it one hour? Is it two hours? Is it four hours? Is it a day? Is it a week? Every second that, that clock is ticking is a second that your business is not going forward, right? So you really need your partners to be very responsive. And you may not know a lot about packaging design, you may not know a lot about quality control, but you can very quickly see who gets back to your emails. And it's a great way to measure you know, who a good partner is without having to have that expert uh, experience. They should be experienced and if possible, which is pretty difficult with startups. Because this field that we're playing in is very different, the, the model is different, the market strategy is different, hopefully they're, they're, they have some experience working with startups. It may not be feasible, um, although more and more every year, every day, it, it is becoming more feasible. So the, these fields of expertise are difficult. It takes a long time to learn a lot of the stuff. So. It's difficult to, to have success with people who are, are still uh, uh, kind of learning the ropes themselves. Finally, as factories, they uh, or as, as your partners in manufacturing, they need to be able to execute at the factory level. It's very difficult to get things done. Uh, a lot of the details that you're going to need to overcome in manufacturing are going to happen at the factory. It's going to be tweaking those process parameters. It's going to be modifying that tool or making sure that that tool is is maintained well you know, a lot of those details that if they're not ready to be on the ground at a moment's notice they're not going to be able to get the stuff done that needs to happen a big one as far as the strategy goes <clears throat> that i found a lot of misconception on is who's responsibility is what, right? What is your responsibility and what is the factory's <coughs> responsibility or your partner's responsibility? And big contracts are built to define this stuff. And those big contracts cost big money. At the end of the end, and, and you know, as soon as those contracts are written, 
they're outdated. Like the next day, <laughs> like you, you spend weeks and months saying who does what, and all of a sudden, oh, we didn't want to change that, you know, that little thing over there. And so all of a sudden, all of those definitions that you put in your contract to, to define everything, now they're, they're you know, you either re, you rewrite the contract or you try to fix it or something, it doesn't usually work well. And at the end of the day, it's going to come down to this. So <clears throat> whatever's in the contract, kind of or not, fundamentally, especially hopefully if you're working with a good partner, is that your responsibility is to define clearly what will be made. You can only do that if you include the tolerances and hopefully you can also include the way that things are tested. Uh, these are three kind of distinctly, well, defining what will be made and the tolerances are kind of the same, but how it will be tested is really a translation of those specifications, which in itself is fairly difficult and something we will talk about a little bit later. Once you do that, it's the factory's job to make that product and test it accordingly. Right? That it's really as simple as that. And you can take all those big, big contracts and you you know, when they go wrong, you can yeah, you can go fight people in court. It, that's almost never the right way to go, especially as a startup who has money, who has a lawyer, you're pretty much, that's a non-option. So you're gonna go back to your relationship, you're gonna go back to those communications. Factories are, Chinese factories, we've had amazing success, and you know, I don't even wanna call it luck because it's so consistent, that if we come to the table and, and we're very, very good at saying, hey, this is exactly what you need to make, and they don't make it, and we've been stressing that over and over and over again for months, they are very good about holding up their end of the bargain and fixing it, and sometimes absorbing very high costs, even if it was their mistake, as long as we were very clear and really pushing that concept from the beginning. When things weren't clear, and we've, we've taken over midstream for a lot of customers who said, oh, I have this product, and..." You know, I gave them the design and they, they didn't include an on-off button. I can't even turn it on. Well, you didn't put an on-off button in there. Right? They, they're following your instructions and factories are very good at what they're designed to do is build things to specifications. If you specify not having an on-off button, that's what they're gonna do and that's their job. So you need to be very clear in the beginning and, and we'll talk about the tools of how you can do that. but. Very important, this is your responsibility and their responsibility. <laughs> Communication, you know, I touch on this, it's a, kind of a hard thing to improve on a little bit, but it makes a huge difference from our perspective on the quality and the ability of the clients that we work with. Um, one thing is, think about it, just think about it, right? Is, is what you're writing, is what you're saying, is it taking more time than it needs to, is it, being as clear and concise as it needs to, you're going to be covering a thousand details in your process from design through production. If you're taking twice as long every time, if you're saying the same things twice, or if you're saying them, you know, in, in more effort than they, in, in more time than they need, or especially, you know, if there's a language barrier with words that are difficult, right? You want to use simple language, you just want to be to the point, you want to say it once, you want to be clear, and you want to keep it organized, right? <coughs> You're going to need to communicate all of the details, right? You need to give this big picture, so you want to do that in a very organized way. A hundred emails in two weeks is not the right way to do it, right? One email, two emails, an Excel sheet, maybe a Word document, some pictures. Uh, you know, really try to keep that communication very clear to the point uh, so that people can understand it and it doesn't take a lot of effort and, and a lot of time for them to do that. Communicating again, this is a bit more for the uh, language barrier. Uh, written is better than oral. You know, there's these programs where you can mouse over words and it'll give you the definition in Chinese. Beautiful thing, right? If you're speaking to a Chinese factory, 
Their English may be pretty good, but they might not know that one word. And if you're doing it orally, you're gone. And they're nodding their head saying yes with absolutely no understanding of what you just said. All right? If you do it in a written format, great. They can look it up. They can take their time. It's recorded. If they weren't thinking about um, you know, what they're going to have for dinner or whatever at that time, it still is going to be captured and they, they're going to be able to uh, follow through with that. For that reason, we really like Skype, and I should say, you know, any uh, platform that allows you to speak and write at the same time, because you can be explained. Sometimes, a lot of times, speaking, you, you know, you can get to the point, you can get down to business, and you can express emotion. There's a lot of very valuable things to that. Uh, but for complicated words, then you know, if you need to talk about. Uh, you know, the radius or the viscosity or whatever you have that is really important, you can type that in as you're speaking. That can be looked up real time. There's almost no <coughs> drop in the communication. You're flying through things very effectively. Um, also, it's great to have that oral uh, communication recorded, right? Same thing as writing an email, but some of the important points, hey, there's three takeaways from our communication, bam, 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 you're done, and everyone's on the same page. <laughs> Be humble. Yeah. There's a lot that you don't know. There's a lot that all of us don't know. I'm learning things every day. I've been doing this for 12 years, and you know, we're with hundreds and hundreds of people, and every day I learn something, and it's awesome. There's a lot to know, and it's, it's really cool. But you're not going to learn that stuff if you're talking all the time, if you're pushing your agenda, if you're not accepting that there's a lot of experts out there who know their stuff and, and are going to help you. So take the time to listen, really invite that, you know, try to absorb as much as you can. Um, because but those are going to be the moments that change your course, right? You've got a lot of great ideas. 99.9999% of the time, your original great ideas are not going to be the ones that take you to market successfully. It's going to be those rare moments where you think here's somebody else's idea, like, wow, that is, I'm definitely doing that. It's going to save me $10,000 or it's going to be get me to market faster or something like that. But if you're kind of constantly pushing and not, not really listening and trying to learn, you're not going to have those same kind of experiences. I just threw this slide in here, and I keep talking about this, and so I thought I'd try to hit it a little bit more specifically, but um, there's really two roads to success in, in hardware startup world, and one is kind of the organic model of not borrowing a ton of money and trying to grow slowly. The other is borrowing and selling, borrowing a bunch of money, selling a lot of your company, and scaling quickly, and, and I think there's not a great understanding of these two paths and, and how divergent they are. If you're going organic, you are you need to be honed in on your cash flow every day, all the time, every dollar you have, unless you happen to be Donald Trump and get a small loan of a million dollars. You're gonna, you know, that money is probably gonna be pretty important to you. And so you need to know where it's going and where your next money is coming in. Or you need to be making sales, and, and you need to be replenishing your supply to get stuff done. That's very, very different. It's going to be friends and family promoting your product. It's going to be finding uh, maybe a small loan, you know, or maybe an angel or something to get that first production run out there, but then really quickly trying to recoup that money, a lot of pre-sales, you know, stuff like that, and really pushing your um, outreach, you know, early on, right? If you go the VC route, you're looking at a five-year exit, right? You don't go to VCs to build a long-term company. You go to VCs to sell your company. That is a key thing to know. VCs want to sell your company. They don't make their money until you sell your company. So you need to have an exit strategy and you need to know how you're going to get there. So you're going to scale like crazy. You're going to burn all their money, right? And, and you're hopefully in the right ways. That's cash flow is still obviously very important, but 
It's, it's a matter of burning money quickly in order to grow very quickly, in order to sell very quickly, versus you know, building all the systems to create a great long-term uh, environment where you're gonna you know, create, you know, I, and I don't wanna say, both need reputation, there's a lot of similarities, but um, you know, if you're growing organically, you're really not necessarily looking to sell, right? If you're going to VC, you gotta be selling the revenue, you gotta be selling the growth, the value proposition to be able to get bought by a bigger company and so forth. A uh, few reasons why hardware is really built to scale is that you have huge fixed costs, right? Two of those, one is tooling, if you're doing injection molding or, or other tooling, you're probably looking at at least ten thousand dollars for a small product, up to fifty, hundred, two hundred thousand for larger products. Um, you also have minimum order quantities, right? You, you might be looking at a thousand, five thousand units as your minimum order. You know, even if you're say you're, it's ten dollars a unit, you might be looking at you know fifty thousand dollars for that first run. If you can't sell that quickly, you're sitting on $40,000 for a long time. If you've got $40,000 lying around to cover that, great. Most people don't, and you need to be spending that $40,000 marketing and doing other stuff anyway. So you've really got to look at trying to, to go through and, and replenish that cash flow. It's a business of economies of scale. You know, one for the tooling that we just talked about. Uh, to you know, if you're ordering the, the minimum order, you're probably paying 100% more, 50% more at least probably for that minimum order than you are at something that's more steady state. So your business, your competitors are all paying the steady state price. Right? They're paying 50% less potentially than you are for that same product. So you're gonna maybe start out losing money Right, the market expects to pay what your competitors have already sold the product for. You can't take a bag, you know, and, and sell a fifty dollar bag when everyone's been selling you know, buying it for thirty dollars. So you 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 might need to come out and lose some money to gain that market share. You're not going to make money until you get into those larger orders where you can get those economies of scale. Finally. One of my first questions to, to folks is what is your go-to-market strategy? If people tell me I'm gonna sell it directly to consumers, I tell them go back to your marketing strategy board and think about it. It doesn't really work for hardware. Um, I, don't want, I certainly don't want to say ever, right? If, if you're really amazing and you can sell a lot and you can really drum up business, it's possible, but I just haven't seen it work. And, and people in the know don't really want to work with you, they don't want to support you because it doesn't, there's, you're not really supporting the ecosystem, the ecosystem isn't really supporting you. It's a great idea, right? You get, usually your four or five X, great number to know, uh, from your FOB cost in Shenzhen to retail price, almost, like large, large majority of products, products are four to five times uh, your FOB costs. That can change if you get into large numbers, hundred dollars plus retail. It can go down to three X. But you need to build in that margin. If you're paying for your product for ten dollars FOB China, you need to be selling it at forty or fifty dollars. Retailers will not work with you otherwise. Distributors won't work with you, and. Uh, you, you can lower that if you go direct to consumer, that's one potential advantage, but you better be amazing at marketing because there's just nothing like being at the store and seeing that product and buying it. Um, so 15%, you know, we will, and, and I, I don't know about this in China, I'm just really curious, but in the US, uh, online sales, as popular and as amazing as, as it is, and as much stuff as I buy on Amazon, I almost can't believe it. Uh, but 15%, only 15% of what we buy online, uh, or uh, total, is bought online. 85% of what we buy still is bought through retail channels. So, um, and then a lot of that stuff that we buy online, too, is not innovative hardware startup stuff, right? It's stuff that we 
really are familiar with. You can buy a USB cable online because you know what it does, you know the price, you know it's going to work. You know, supporting a new product that you have no idea what it is, you're not sure if it's going to work, you're not sure if the company is going to refund your money. If it doesn't, it's another story. So, um, to scale, you really want to think of what is your go to market strategy for retail distribution. And so you really want to understand what retailers want. What is what is your term sheet? Right? What how do you support their marketing? These are a lot of things that startups are not thinking about. That at the end of the day, as good as your product might be, as your idea might be, retailers are not going to buy it just because it's a good idea. They're looking at how much money can they make per square foot on your product? Can you keep them from being out of stock? And can you help? Uh, their products sell from the three foot rule, from the six foot rule, right? Can you educate the customer fast enough that when they're walking by, they see your product, they come closer, they come closer again, they pick it up, they put it in their cart, right? These are really important things to be thinking about really early on. So how, how do you do this stuff? <clears throat> oh man, I'm, I'm way late. All right. <laughs> I really try to fly here. So, I, I can fly through this stuff a little bit because we do have it online. Um, how do you paint a clear picture? These are, this is the execution, right? So the engineering package is how you define things well. Being connected on the ground is really how you control things. And test thoroughly is how you really make sure you don't get into trouble. Imagine you want to build a picture as a hardware startup. If you give the factory this JPEG to build your picture from, or PDF, that's what they're going to build, right? If you wanted to build this, there is no way for them to build this out of the information you gave them. This is very similar to a lot of the information we get, right? We have this random drawing, great. You know, it's seen in your mind, it may make a lot of sense, but when you plug it into injection molding machines and stamping and assembly lines and everything else, it turns out that there's not enough information to get what you really need. The important thing too is that the fuzzier you give the information, factories are all competing on price. They know that you're going to go with the lowest price option, so they're going to give you the price. They, they may know that you kind of want to build this, right? But you gave them this information, they're like, oh, I can make this for nothing. <laughs> like, you're going to come with me, I'll make this for two bucks. And you go with them, and then, and then later they're like, oh, you want to build this? That's going to be $10. Like, you didn't tell me that. And, uh, but they're not really going to be up front with you in the beginning, right? So you, it's your job to paint this clear picture. The tools that you do this, the product requirements document, this is a document that shows your expectations of the product in the market. These are all the fuzzy details that factories won't always ask for, and you may be kind of afraid even to give them to them. Um, but usually the factories are not your competitors. The people that are going to rip off your product are going to be companies that can go to market, right? A lot of factories cannot go to market and educate a customer on your product. It's really, really hard. You want them to know what you need to make. So tell them, you know, what should it look like? How durable should it be in the market? Does it need to be food safe? What certifications do you need? What does the user interface need to look like? What's user target demographic, right? Uh, does it need to be used inside or outside? All of these other details will help the factory use their expertise to build a better product that's going to meet your needs. The build materials, uh, fundamentally, is just a list of all, this, all the components in your product. It's going to tell the factory every little thing that you need to build. You can include some other information there, like tolerances and, and other things if it makes sense. It's not, maybe not always the best place for that information, but most importantly, it's going to be a complete makeup to make sure that nothing is forgotten and that everything is going to come together at the end of the day uh, well enough. It's the advantage sometimes, especially with electric, you're going to have a mechanical and an electrical bill of materials. They're separate things. Um, when you include part numbers for in that bill of materials, it allows your factory to look for replacements. A lot of times in China, you can find a cheaper local solution that can provide the same kind of quality and can help make you competitive with your competitors who are doing the same thing. 
um, you, you can sometimes find shorter lead time. Sometimes if you say, hey, I need this one thing, well, that may need to be imported. You may need, it may have an import tax, and it may have a 12-week lead time, whereas you find something local that can be a one-week lead time, no import tax. Uh, so for it, it gives a lot of the specifications. A lot of the you know the part numbers can be uh, Google, Baidu, and you can get a ton of information about that one part with one little number versus you trying to write out you know the resistance at 85 degrees Celsius or whatever that you are almost certainly not going to, going to know. So um, it's a really great way to, to communicate a lot of information very quickly to the factory. Technical files. Uh, Looking here mostly, most common, you're looking at 2D files, 3D files. So 2D, um, you know, mostly gives like tolerance, it's great for metals, uh, particularly it's great for calling out dimensions. Um, 3D files, you know, SolidWorks, uh, Autodesk uh, files give complete information about the product. Um, it can be a little hard to look up tolerances sometimes in a 3D file, it may be possible. But that's where it can be very beneficial to provide both. Uh, some of the things you can do with a 3D file, you can measure like the weight of plastic. You can measure the, the amount of runner that you need in that injection mold. That can really help provide a very uh, quantitative, clear uh, picture of, of what the material costs are going to be and, and, and provide a better quote. Uh, you, can look, you need to look at a lot of the information here. You know, this is this is really the guts of what you're sharing. Usually, with the factory, they're going to look at shrinkage, undercuts. You know, if you're looking at tooling sliders and so forth. Um, and uh, one note I want to make: surface. Think about surface finishes. This is one of the most common things that is forgotten. You know, you there's a lot of surface. Everything has a surface. Right? And every surface often makes a big difference in sometimes the functionality, but certainly the aesthetics. Is it glossy? Is it matte? How glossy? How matte? Um, you know, affects colors. It affects a lot of other things. So, you know, think about uh, what you can do with that surface, and, and make sure that you clearly define that with the manufacturer. If you don't, they're going to do what's easy, right? And that may not be best for your product and your market. For more complex parts that where the other things were not sufficient to give enough information to clearly define what you want to make, you need to create a separate document that really clearly does that, right? This is important for, say, like motors or sub-assemblies of stuff where there might be a lot going on. You know, mostly you just need to look at all the other stuff and think, okay, is it everything that I need to define clearly defined in those things. If not, make this document, right? Make something that fills in those holes. Um, Pantone numbers, if you're doing color, you know, make sure that needs to be defined. There's like an infinite number of reds, right? <laughs> can be pinkish, can be purplish, you name it. Pantone number, man, you've got it very well defined. Um, Finally, your prototype. So after all this, after you all put all this theoretical documentation together, remember that all of that stuff is on paper. It's all somewhat theoretical at the end of the day. If you're gonna see how something really works, really looks, it's gonna be physical, right? It's gonna be three-dimensional and something people can pick up and use. Um, what you make is probably almost 100% not going to be the manufactured product, right? If there's tooling involved, you're not going to be able to make a product that is exactly like a tooled product in a prototype. Um, so what you want to do is you want to give your prototype, your, your finalized design of prototype, and then you want to clearly define, hey, this is what I really like about it, what I really need. This is what I don't like about it, but I'd like to change this is what I have to change because I can't have it blow up or whatever else. And this is what I would like to change. And you need to give some flexibility then to your partners to take that information and use all of your other information to make the best product that they can for you. Um, the more clear you can be about that, 
you know, the better off you're going to be. So, uh, quality control. Um, some quick things. You have all these specifications, right? That you just you, you put all that engineering package together, and now you need to check if it works or not. You have to translate all of those specifications into something that can really be checked. Right? If you're going to check something, you need a tool, you need a person, you need an environment. You, you need all of this stuff that was not covered at all in the specifications. Um, your, your factory or your partner should know roughly how to do this stuff, and they'll have a lot of great tools that they can provide to you. But they're not going to know what your market is going to accept. They're not going to know exactly how this stuff is going to be used. So you want to really work with them to make sure that the inspection guidelines that the final outgoing inspection is done by covers all of the specifications, because uh, they're going to be the best people to do it. They should be able to make a perfect product if you've done your job and clearly identified it ahead of time, and you work with them on how to, to check that stuff. Um, but they're not going to do that unless you really work with them and, and figure out how to do that. Make sure you catch the effects on the, before they get on the boat. If you're shipping to Europe or the U.S. where most markets will be, if it's on the boat and it arrives in the U.S. and it is a container full of defective products, man, that you know, having the defective product there, one, it's almost certainly thrown away. Not only do you have to replace it, you have to figure out a way to throw it away. That's going to cost you money. All of the money that it costs to replace that product is going to be the least of your worries because now all the customers that you were already late to deliver to are going to be super pissed. And if it's Target or if it's Walmart or if it's a big customer, you're done. You cannot have an empty store shelf for them uh, at all. You are you're done, and um, most likely you're out of business. That's it. So you have to be really, really, really careful to catch defects, especially consistent defects that would be across the entire lot before they get on the boat. So make sure that you use a third-party QC group or be there yourself to uh, check it. Right, you cannot afford, you know, it's not that much money to really check that stuff well. Make sure you do that at the factory. Very, the most rudimentary quality control, there's three processes. There's incoming, there's in processes, there's outgoing, there's incoming raw materials, there's in process that will be checked kind of as things get built across the lines. There's outgoing. Your factory and your partners have to do this, right? You're not going to be well equipped enough to really be at the factory checking all this stuff. If you are, you're probably not doing your job as a founder to be in front of customers and raising money and all the stuff, other stuff you need to do. But you need to be in control of this. You need to make sure at the end of the day, nobody has done a bait and switch. Nobody is, you know, pulling things over your eyes. So. You do need to make sure that that's there, and you, it really helps to make sure your factory knows that you're going to do this, right? If they know you're going to be there, there's actually a much higher likelihood that they won't have problems because they're just wasting their time at that point. Right? So you make, you make that pretty clear. Testing limitations. Am I cool to keep going? You got that right? You got a few more minutes? I promise I'm almost done. So. Uh, it's, it's really a lot of the testing limitations, understand these, that you're only as good as the tools being used, right? If somebody is uh, using their eyes, there's a limitation. If somebody's using calipers, there's a limitation. There's tolerances to all of these tools, right? So your tests are only good as, as good as the tools. They're only valid in the environment and at the time being tested, right? You put all that stuff that you just worked out that was perfect, in a container that gets up to 55 degrees Celsius and 80 percent humidity on the water for 18 days, that's a different product, right? Like it can be. And so you need to understand that things in the environment will change. If you're making a chair, you know, you can test it very well that it's strong enough for someone to sit in at the factory. <coughs> if you have somebody sit in that chair a thousand times over the course of a year, you know, that, that may be a different chair, right? It can, things, joints can get weak, things can break. So the real trickiness to testing is durability and safety. And these are kind of related. 
because this is related to how your product changes over time in the market and in the use case scenarios, the only advice I can give is just think about this a lot. Right? Think about the use cases, think about how it can break down and really try to predict these.